Ah, there goes our recording. Um, uh, it's part of a, a larger unit, then this would just be one segment of that unit. And I will hand it off to Jenny. All right, uh, we broke it up, like she said, into primary, intermediate, and secondary because we had all different grade levels in our group. Um, so the essential questions changed a little. Some of them were the same. Um, they all had, um, what is an estuary and where would you find one? Um, because that was the research that he presented to us and um, led to the experiment that we're doing. Um, but you know, in the, in the primary grades, uh, why do scientists model? Um, how do we use scientific tools to collect data more basic? And then it moves up as you go um, into the intermediate and secondary, okay? And then the academic vocabulary, same thing. We split it into primary, intermediate, and secondary. Um, as you can see, the primary is pretty basic mass, volume, temperature. Um, but when we move up to the intermediate and secondary, we broke the temperature down into Fahrenheit and Celsius um, and added a couple of, of words there. Um, but basically just to differentiate it for the different grade levels so that it wasn't too difficult for the, the younger ones. This is my slide, I'm Kristen. So again, we continued breaking things down into primary, intermediate and secondary for the prior knowledge. So for prior knowledge for our elementary kiddos, we'd want them to have a basic understanding of science inquiry and questioning and understand the rules of teamwork when it comes to conducting science experiments and have the, have the ability to discriminate between land and water on a map. As they get a little older, you want them to know the difference between mass and weight, whereas in the younger grades, you could kind of already pre-measure the materials for them for the lab. And with you guys all being elementary, I'll just let you read the secondary part. Um, then we made connections to our other subject areas. So in our younger grades, it can connect to social studies because we can locate Florida on a map and identify different bodies of water. <clears throat> Whereas in the intermediate grades, you might want them to identify Florida's estuaries on a map. So getting a little bit more advanced. For math, um, just understanding how to record the measurements would be best for the younger grades. And then as they get older, they can find density using division. We did say in our materials list later that we would provide a calculator so they could do conversions if needed. Um, and then for language arts, being able to follow directions orally and in writing. And then again, as they get a little older, being able to write their results using proper grammar, structure, vocabulary, et cetera. And I'm not gonna read all of these to you, but the standards we focused on were primarily nature of science standards and then some of those physical science strands too. And it's the standards that you hit, it all depends on what you want to get out of the experiment. Um, whenever you go into our folder, you'll see that we each edited the lesson to fit our needs. Um, or our grade levels. I am our school STEM coordinator, so I had to make my lesson plan fit all grade levels. So my lesson plan, if you look at it, is a week long and it's a 5E model. And then I also added in a song about the estuary and shuffle and the song lyrics are in our folder. And then there's also a list in our folder of some different areas where you would find estuaries in Florida. So you can look in our folder to find additional information. And then also one of our resources was Dr. Valle's slideshow that he started with at the beginning of the week. But I deleted a bunch of his slides so that I could use some of what he had for my classroom. So it is also in the folder that we have. Um, for this particular experiment, I would use it as a demonstration, but you can also use it. Students can complete it in groups or alone. You could do it as a video, but the materials you would need would be coffee, whole milk, whole milk, a squirt bottle, a digital scale calculator, and a nine by 13 glass dish. And the reason that you would use a glass dish is because it's clear and they can see through it to see the layers of the coffee and the milk before they mix together and as they're mixing together. And then the directions, you would have them measure or you would measure in advance depending on how you're using it. 
um, the coffee and the milk, and then they would find the density, or you could find it for them depending on how you're using it or your grade level. And then after you find the density, you would pour the coffee in and then very slowly add the milk using a squirt bottle. You wouldn't want to pour it all in because then it all, you can't really see how it slides together because the whole point of this is to see that the higher density liquids slide under the lower density liquids and then they start to mix together like in the estuaries and then um, they would observe their interactions and reactions and then discuss and document their observations. I think that's Stephanie's part. You're still muted, Stephanie, or at least I don't hear you. The chain the has to change, it's still showing step-by-step -step directions. On my screen, it's the accommodations for ESC and ESOL. Okay. Does everyone else see accommodations on their screen? Yes, that's what I see. If okay. you have yours, Stephanie, do you have, do you have yours pulled up in another tab? Maybe you could just read off of Separate. I'll have to read this one, Stephanie, until your switches. That's, if you want. That's, that's what I'm doing. I, I just pulled it up on a different okay. panel. Um, accommodations for ESE and ESOL students. The following accommodations can help special population students within your learning environment by making the lessons accessible to all learners. So we we brainstormed, uh, stormed, and thought, uh, what are different ways to actually do this lesson? Um, a slideshow with visuals and voiceover that provides step-by-step -step instructions for perhaps auditory or visual learners. Um, worksheets with fill in blank sections, again, for, for students that, that perhaps second language students. Um, Pre-measured and clearly labeled materials. And then um, sometimes you might have to demonstrate or model the lab. Um, hang on a second, okay. Um, assessments, again, they change depending on primary, intermediate or secondary grades. Um, formatives for the primary would be to illustrate each step and write a sentence about what happened. So perhaps more an illustration. Um, they could do a, a timed pair share what happened and why. In intermediate grades, um, a formative could be an exit ticket about what they learned about density or whatever you want to focus the lesson on. Um, or they could present a project to the class of what they learned. Do you guys hear Stephanie? No. Stephanie had um, like an unstable in internet connection this week. The so I, to the react. Oh, Stephanie, we, we kind of hear you now. Pardon? Oh, you were out for a minute. We heard you share primary. Can you go over intermediate again? Sure. Um, so intermediate would be more of an exit ticket about what they learned about density. Um, and they could also present perhaps a project to the group of what they learned. And then the, the higher grades would be um, a discussion with guided open questions, more of an inquiry. She's frozen now. I could, I'll take, I'll finish off where she was. Um, so guided open questions, what is an estuary? How do you find the mass volume and density of a liquid? How do you change grams to kilograms? So kind of um, you know, if we did sort of a task analysis of, of each skill, oh, no, she's out again. Um, task analysis of each skill they should have learned and then, you know, create a discussion from each of those. And then they could also um, present to the class either using a science journal or a digital presentation similar to where, what we're doing here. I don't remember, was Stephanie also on extension activities? Yes. Oh, okay. I think you're good now, Stephanie, if you want to continue. Am I, I'm, I'm, I'm back, okay. Um, so the extension activities, give me a second, it's, it's loading, I'm okay. Um, suggested activities to complete after the lesson, um, in addition to, would be explore how the combinations of saltwater and freshwater impact the biodiversity in the estuaries. 
have different groups use different liquids like heavy cream, 2% milk, coconut milk, and, and observe the, and discuss the differences. Change the landscape perhaps of the pan on the bottom to see how the effects of the liquids flowing changes as landscapes change. And perhaps even change the temperature of the liquids to demonstrate go, um, global warming which we should, the kids should start to focus on. Okay, um, that was the end of our presentation. Um, I don't know, do we wanna take a few questions at the end of each one or just kind of move on? If anyone had any questions specific to what we did, um, everything is in our folder if you wanna you know, revisit that. Okay, um, so let me stop sharing my screen. So the next group could start and I will tell you guys who that is, if anyone wanted to ask a question was, I don't know if there's anything in the chat. Um, no, I think that was, I think that was everything. Um, okay, the next group we have presenting is C to C. So if that group is ready, whoever's in charge of that group can start to share their screen and I will mute myself. Okay, that is us. I will start to share my screen. Can you guys see it? Okay. Um, so we took all of our ideas. We each did a different lesson plan, um, but we just put it into one PowerPoint, um, each one taking a slide. So. We can go from there. We were with C to C with um, Bill Turner. He, I pulled it up so you guys can see it. Um, it is a program with students. They do camps and um, he'll come to schools and do a whole bunch of hands-on activities. Really, really awesome. So let's go back to, all right, hold on. So starting off here, I believe I was first. Okay, so mine is going to be on behavioral versus physical adaptations. I teach fourth grade. Um, I thought it would be neat to start off with um, Bill, just kind of as our introduction into the lesson. He will virtually visit the classroom or a little far away, and um, he'll have a discussion first talking about observations versus inferences, and then it'll lead into physical versus behavioral adaptations. I have this video here that he took himself. Um, that we'll play for the kids. I won't play the whole video for you, but they start off by talking about observations and inferences. Um, just with this, you can see right here, he's getting ready to make a move. Um, but then it goes on to Fiddler Crabs, which is our main focus, uh, talking about how they have both physical and behavioral adaptations. So he'll show his personal video. Once he has finished, we're gonna discuss as a class and then we will do a Generation Genius. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. It's a program that our school purchased, but um, they have a wide variety of science videos. So there'll be just an additional, like with more background knowledge on different types of adaptations. And then we will play a Kahoot, an online quiz game to kind of um, test their comprehension on what they have learned. And then as my assessment piece, it's more of an informal assessment where they're going to complete a sort on behavioral versus physical adaptations, sorting them, see if they can uh, tell the difference between the two. And some of them are kind of like in the middle where it can be a physical and behavioral. So it'll be great for discussion with the kids afterwards as well. So that one is mine. Next up is... It's my turn. Yes. What is a seashell? Um, how many of your students realize that seashells they find on the beach are once living creatures? Since we live on the um, Gulf of Mexico, everyone in Navarre has access to the beach and we actually do get some seashells that wash up. And uh, a lot of kids just think they, they come that way, you know, empty. 
So our lesson is to help your students understand the seashell phylum mollusca and the difference between the two types, gastropods and bivalves. Students will learn to classify and identify these shells and uh, understand how shells are made with scientist Bill Turner so they can understand what the creature is that lives inside and how it makes the shell, what the shell is for. Um, then we're gonna watch a Blue Planet video about a, a horse conch that goes after and eats a poor little tulip shell while there are a bunch of hermit crabs nearby. Um, and once the shell, the tulip shell is eaten, the uh, hermit crabs will go for the, uh, the shell that's been left behind. We're also gonna start off with the book, Is This a House for Hermit Crab? So that, um, that will tie into the beginning because we'll uh, be looking at what kind of house does hermit crab have? Is that part of the hermit crab? What kind of animals the hermit crab, et cetera, like that. And finally, what we're gonna do is we're gonna be making a model of a gastropod called a pasta pod and it's right up here. It's made out of pasta noodles and model magic and you let it dry and then they can paint them whatever colors and then you glue it onto um, a piece of cardstock and they can draw and label the different parts of anatomy of a gastropod. So that's fine. Next up is Sean. Okay, I am focusing on um, marine animal adaptions. Um, I teach kindergartens, so mine's a little um, basic. Um, we're going to be using a book called um, Ocean Animal Adaptions by Julie Murphy. I'm going to show it to the kids and we're going to just, without reading it, just go through the pictures and everything. Um, and we're going to complete a KWL chart, um, what you know, um, what you want to know, and what we've learned. And um, based off of the, the picture walk, we're going to uh, try to figure out what adaption means and everything. And then um, we'll look at it and go uh, figure out what we want to learn from the book and then we'll read the book and discuss what we've learned. Um, then on the second day, Bill will come and vi virtually through Zoom and he will um, talk about the echinoderms, starfish, um, oh my goodness, I forgot what they're called. Uh, <laughs> He will show them live specimens of, um, of the different echinoderms and the type of adaptions that they have. And um, we'll di discuss the adaptions through that. And then on the third day, um, we'll go over what we've learned over the past two days and then using salt clay and all different accessories, the kids will pair up and they'll make their own creatures and come up with their own adaptions and then they'll present to the class as to what, they, what they've done and why um, they've made those adaptions and what the adaptions are used for. That's, that will basically be my assessment for them. All right, and then next is Anne. Hey there, I'm Ann Meyer and I teach kindergarten and mine is very similar to Sean's. I got a lot of excellent ideas from my group and I combined many different aspects of it. So you'll see a lot of similarities there. So have you ever wondered why marine life looks the way it does? That's the spin that, that I'm taking on it with the adaptations. And so I have laid it out as a four day plan, seeing that it's kindergarten and that it's going to take a little bit of time. So we're gonna start off with the book of um, Mr. Seahorse by Eric Carl. If you've ever seen it, the, the animals are camouflaged in it. So immediately we'll start looking at adaptations, but I'm not gonna introduce that word right away to them. That's going to be our Monday plan along with the, each kiddo will receive a, I say each kiddo, each group will have a bucket of 
shelves and different items in it that they can pour out, they can sort. I'm not, I'm just going to ask them to sort. This activity will be done in late April, May. And that way, at that point in time, they will have a lot of the prerequisite skills that they need in order to be successful at it. On day two, we'll repeat that sorting, but this time it'll be with different marine animals. I have ones from starfish all the way to the ones that we tend to think about, the fish and the dolphins. And again, there'll be a sort for the kids. And this time what I'm kind of looking for is more the adaptations that are occurring. And the, the children this time will do a walking field trip around to each table and try to guess how, you know, what, what's the sort. So in our class, I call it guess, guess my sort. So that will be, I will use the book, Ocean Animal Adaptations by Julie Murphy. And then each day we'll be writing about our findings. And then the third day, in comes Bill Turner. And we're so excited to have him with the touch tanks. We've had him out to our school. I'm the coordinator for that for our school. Um, and so I'll be really excited as he presents more information, the children actually have an opportunity to touch and feel and see and observe. Again, we'll write about our findings in our journals. And all of this is leading up to day four, where the children will take all their knowledge. They're going to create a marine animal using, they can, I have many choices in my room, so they can use it out of paper, they can make it out of clay, they can make it out of Play-Doh, you get the gist. Um, and the kiddos will be able to create their ocean animal. And again, I'm looking for that they are including the adaptations that they've learned about. For our worksheet aspect of it, I'm going to have a large chart. And let's see, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can pop it over to what I have already created or not. I'm gonna try it and see. Hopefully it won't mess everybody up. Uh, it's not gonna do it. On the chart, I have a, the chart itself has adaptations and going down the bottom column, I have movement. How, how do they eat? And how do they, um, golly, I forgot my other one. Anyways, there's three of them. And the first one, I have a picture of people because I want them to think first of us. That's what they know the most about. So what things do we use in order to travel? Our feet, how do we eat? We use our fingers, we use our mouth. I don't want them to go into forks and spoons. I just want them to think like basic animal. It's okay if they do, of course. And then um, what, you know, what body parts do we have? And our, our camouflage, that's the third one. And then they're gonna compare it over to say the starfish or to whatever sea animal we're featuring. I usually run this unit for about a month. So this will be the backbone to my unit this time, the adaptation. Any questions? No. <clears throat> there was a lot of positive feedback in the um, chat if you get a chance to read through that. <laughs> And then we have one last. Thank you. Oh, your beautiful background. And then we have Deanna. Hey, um, I have uh, kindergarten through fifth grade in um, my classes uh, often are multi-grade level. So um, I just did, if you look in the folder, I just uh, combined it into one lesson after all. It was getting too tedious breaking it out. But uh, we're going to work on understanding the adaptations and taxonomy, uh, sorry, I can't even speak, of invertebrates and focusing on the um, echoderms. And so they'll um, learn about the characteristics and what makes them unique. And so then we'll have some sorting activities, some videos, books, and uh, also have um, Turner in with showing um, live animals as well as some other media to really kind of pull uh, from what they already know that they don't maybe really 
realize they know. And then uh, again, like the other ones, we'll make a model that they can explain what it is and the different pieces and parts and what makes them unique and, and helps them survive in their environment. And that was our group. Oh, I'm going to move on. We have about 43 minutes for the lot for the next three groups. So I'm going to move forward, but definitely look back in the chat because there were a lot of great comments. The next group is St. John's River Water Management. So I will meet myself and share your screen. Okay. Can you see our screen? Okay. I guess I'll introduce us. Um, our group, um, we're the St. John Water Management. We were with Jennifer Mitchell. She's just amazing when it comes to a lot of water information. Um, we have our group comprised of kindergarten and a lot of fifth grade teachers. So we have two lessons. Our first one is fourth and fifth grade. And I'll let whoever's gonna start describing that, go ahead and begin. Oh, I guess I should have said, we chose erosion and how to incorporate water, the water cycle into erosion because especially as fifth grade teachers, we realize that this is a major um, topic that our students still struggle with. Sorry, I can't find how to move it though. There it is. Hi everyone, these are the standards that we were focusing on. We know how important uh, erosion is in fourth and fifth grade. Um, we also know that there's a time constraint only about four days to teach it in fourth grade. So um, we wanted to focus on the plants and their role um, within the standards. Also um, heavy into the observations, you know, recording things into your science notebook. We also uh, want to talk about the, uh, the differences between the physical weathering and of course erosion. And then the water cycle will also be part of this. So our learning objective um, was basically the water cycle, weathering, and erosion. Um, the students are going to be, to be able to describe and understand the uh, physical uh, weathering and, of course, erosion also. Some essential questions that we were thinking about um, is how does erosion impact you? And we obviously want them to explain their answer. We want to know if they understand um, after having a hands-on opportunity to be able to um, able to know what they were um, doing. Also give an example of an erosion using the water cycle. So here we are tying in the water cycle with um, erosion for um, knowledge and understanding. So we decided um, to come up with a hands-on activity um, using more senses. Obviously, kids will be able to have an impact and be able to relate to real-world application. So these are the materials. I don't need to read through those, basically, for the um, activity that we will be doing. So in order to um, get this lesson started, we thought that it would be great to have Jennifer. She's inspiring and she knows a lot about um, things that go on with water um, to be able to have a good understanding of water cycle uh, before this um, activity starts. Oops, sorry about that. All right, so we followed the five E's model and um, we decided to start off with a video, which is of a river flowing, which kind of shows the overtime time lapse of erosion. And the whole main goal that we're going to have students is just kind of have them um, say what they noticed in the video to try to bring in their own ideas. Hopefully they have some really good ones to share. And for the main bulk of the activity is um, going to be our explore stage which is we're gonna have those students in groups of three and four. And then you're going to have the plastic shoe box with um, sand and create a water channel for the stream. Um, you're going to prop the shoe box with um, some books. We did indicate that at least the book should be at least one inch to help. Obviously the students can create that a little bit differently based on what they have. 
Um, and then make sure that the spray bottle has different intensities, therefore that they can kind of see how the differences that they'll hopefully see in their observations through mist, a spray, and at least a stream. Um, after that, to end our first day, we're going to have try to have a class or partner discussion um, answering those questions, which we have, how can we stop and reduce or prevent erosion? This is probably one of the bigger questions that I say that we really want the kids to think about how, um, you know, based on what they saw either in the video or mainly in the activity, um, any of the observations that they made or may have marked in their notebooks. And also to relate it back to them and kind of in the real world, um, have them think about what if it was in their backyard, how would they, you know, how would that affect them and what are things that they maybe want to make sure to prevent erosion, hopefully, that would be our main goal. And as for our day two, we decided that the first, um, that second day we would start with the teacher creating the same project, but now adding plants. So hopefully if they can make those connections um, between how are the plants affecting erosion and then we can even talk about a little bit about the plant parts because as we talked about in the standard earlier um that there is we want to talk about how the plant structure can possibly help prevent erosion and they should be able to see it um and as for the very end of our day we're going to have the students talk about it um they can either we have two ideas they can either present it based on what happened in their model or you can also be doing or do both of them too, a whole class T chart where they have to give an example and draw an example of both weathering and erosion so that they can make those differentiations. And, and based on how the class did, you can definitely create your own um, assessment on what do you need to maybe help with the misconceptions that they may have had. And these were some example pictures. We actually got to practice it yesterday to make sure that we kind of see what we wanted to do. Um, Jennifer Mitchell was really great and she actually showed us how and got all the materials, which is really inexpensive and that's super great. And you'll see it's pretty easy and the students should be able to make those connections between the video and their um, project. Did you all see the video? Yes, we were able to see it. Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Debbie. I did the extensions part of this lesson. And um, the reason I did this is because I feel this can be put into a science night or an extension. Um, because really in fourth grade, they, like you said, it was time constraint. So they didn't get a lot of time to work on that. So to build back on in fifth grade, we found, wow, they didn't really get it in those little two lessons they got for whatever reason in fourth grade. So this could be an enrichment um, going into fifth grade. Uh, this is called Save Our Sands. So they get a little bit more of a challenge um, and there's lots of videos. There are lots of resources. There's even lesson plans. If you click on this as a hyperlink, I won't go into it because I know we're on time limit. Um, but it has a lot of, it even gives you, um, you can edit your uh, assessments in there. It's got videos, it's got resources, lots of other hyperlinks that you can get in there. And then the other one was, well, this was actually adapted with the plants. So this could even be like in fifth grade when you have those two weeks of extra before FSA, you know, to get ready for that. Um, you could go back and do this as an extension lesson and see if they can do the plants. Um, what plants do work better or do we do gravel or can we do rocks to prevent the erosion and that really just ties in with our presenter today. I was so excited to see her do the beach and the erosion because we were this ties to our Florida coast. Um, so I love to save the land. I thought it was a perfect engineer perfect stem if you had time. It takes a little bit more time for this one. And then the other one was washed away. Um, this was another one. It shows and it has videos of the ocean showing and, and the erosion that happens even after hurricanes or just a basic rainstorm. I mean, you know, things like that. If you want to go to the next slide for me. I also found some additional reading with this on the next one. So these were books that you could start out with the lesson 
before you got into uh, the actual hands-on part of this. Um, these were a lot of good stories. Um, the scholastic one right here was a great one, great visual for the little, little ones. Like if you're in third grade and you have some really um, students that need that enrichment, this would be a great enrichment for third grade going into fourth grade because they won't have that. Um, so this kind of hits really third, fourth and fifth grade standards if, depending on how you use it and who you have for students. So this is a lot of great resources. Next slide for me. Okay, this was a time-lapse video. Somebody put this up there, I'm not sure. Who, who is this? Oh, this was a time-lapse video that went with our day one. Is somebody reading this part of it or? So these are just um, some, what do you call it, PowerPoints that we created for you to use. Um, so in case you really did wanna do this lesson, they're ready to go. I won't go through it all so that we can get to their K-1 lesson, but they're pretty much done through that day one and day two. Um, we included some great pictures in there. We included some just like guided questions that'll help you that support the lesson, um, the lab directions, everything that you might need. But I want to go ahead and give Valerie time to go ahead and present hers too. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That's what I was about to say. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Thanks, guys. Um, I'll keep mine short and sweet, I promise. <laughs> so I went through it kind of with the idea that if you want to teach this lesson, um, I put this slide deck up in our folder in the St. John's River Water Management so that you can just pull it up, pop it on your smart board and go ahead and teach it. So mine was K1, exploring water with your five senses. Looking at the Florida standard, there's not many for kindergarten for hydrosphere. I'm sure that other primary people realize this as well. So I wanted to focus on making observations of the natural world, using your five senses to observe, and then collaborating with your partners. Um, I did a lot of vertical articulation looking at first grade because with kindergarten, not really focusing on the water cycle or hydrosphere, where do we want them to go? So what background information can we give them? So then it turns into recognizing where we can find water sources, how we can describe it and ways to be safe and conserve it. Um, the overall objective for this activity is to make a connection with the natural world by observing with your five senses. It's a two day lesson, one hour each day. Um, day one is going to be a focus on observing water with the five senses and then going around campus to find water sources that are local to us. And day two is going to be a focus on identifying those different types of water and then how water gets to these different sources. So oh, it's not letting me click. There we go. Okay. Um, you can go through, look at the materials. I'll go ahead and flip to the slide deck. With um, our activity, I made this with the idea that during the year, our big engineering activity that we do is having students make a um, trash collector to get pollution out of the pond. So our um, scientists are going to come and present a lesson activity on water sources that we find around Florida, around our county to make that connection. I'll go back to that. So I broke it down into student activity slide decks. It's gonna hit your target for the day, have students turn and talk, what are ways that we use water? How do we see it? What do we notice about it? So you get them talking about it. And then reviewing our five senses. This is gonna be our explore activity. So students are gonna have the opportunity to explore water with different types of materials. So they'll get bins, have pitchers, cups, porous and non-porous um, materials like sponges or coffee filters. Um, we had the idea of having them bring limestone or the teacher bringing limestone so they can see how water is also affecting with that and then tying it into the Florida aquifers when our scientist comes. So they'll get to explore water and then it'll be part two, where can we find water and we'll go on a scavenger hunt around our campus to notice different waterways. We'll hit different vocabulary cards, review our vocab terms. I'm gonna quickly flip through this. And then we're gonna come back and we're gonna do a bubble map about the water sources that we saw at school and what senses we use to observe them. Their exit ticket for that day is just gonna be sharing um, what water sources they noticed. Day two is then identifying those different water sources. So what they remembered, sharing and reviewing what we saw. And then we are going to do a model activity 
to the KWL chart, so reviewing what we know, what we wonder about water now, and tying it into what we're going to learn. So we had this good idea, our, our scientists did, about um, doing an activity where we have a crumpled paper. I saw the idea of using a plastic um, trash bag or something, and then drawing blue marker lines to represent the waterways of either a river or stream, and then having it pool at the basin underneath, like right at the deep valley of it. And then you're going to spray that blue marker with water so that um, students can see the water moving down to the lowest point. And that's going to tie into our gravity lesson on how did the water get to these water sources? Well, gravity is pulling it down, which will then lead into more of the water cycle activities when they go through those different grades. And so after all of this, we're going to um, discuss gravity and their exit ticket. We'll be talking about the water sources that we saw and reviewing how it got there. And they're going to explain that gravity was what pulled them to these water sources. So if you have any questions or you want more of clarification, the slide deck is within our shared folder. Excellent job. Um, Great job. Group two, or I'm sorry, group three. So now we have two groups left and we have like 27 minutes. So the next one is the South Florida Water Management District. It's not It's not necessarily a hard stop at noon. It's okay if we go over, but if we, oh, okay, we want to gear toward noon, that's okay too. Oh, okay. All right. So I will mute myself and whoever's presenting from the South Florida Water Management District can share their screen. Is Nicole going to share? Yeah, I'm trying to share from my computer. I got you. All right. Um, Perfect. Let me know if you need any assistance, Nicole, anything I could help with. Nicole, we can't hear you. It appears as though it, you're unmuted. It, okay. Yeah, here it is. I'm going to put the link for the Nearpod in the chat so that everybody can see it from their screen. So if you go to nearpod.com, that's the code that you wanna put in. Does everybody see it there, L4VTQ? Do you want me to share that on my screen, Nicole? Um, I think I got it now. Let me turn my phone okay. off. On yeah, let's see it. I'm gonna turn my phone off one second so that it doesn't overlap. All right, can you guys hear me now here? Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. Does everyone have the code or see the code to be able to log in? Yes. All right, perfect. So we'll go ahead and get started. The code will still be up if you still need to come in. Um, and you can take it away, Ayana. I'm Ilana and our group, we, in our group, we have majority fifth grade teachers and then also kindergarten teacher. But um, after listening to the presentations from our two lead um, scientists at the South Florida Water Management District, <laughs> we realized that, you know, obviously this, the information is applicable for K, you know, K to 12 really. So a little bit about, are you pulling up the presentation? Yes, do you guys not see it there? 
all I see is join, join at join near pod.com. Like it's, it's loading. It's just, yeah, it's probably just taking a second. All right. Are you good now? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So you can go ahead and go to slide two. So all of the, all of the resources and presentations are, um, you can find them in the cruise South Florida water management district, um, folder and basically this is you know the mission the mission of the district and um what we learned you know they have flood they work on flood control moving water to the Everglades and then obviously water conservation so our lesson plan that we developed um focuses on the macro invertebrates and also um water filtration so we're going to showcase our macro uh, lesson plan All right. My name is Jose Zabala, and um, I'm a fifth grade teacher at Kinloch Park Elementary here in Miami, Florida. Um, something very interesting about the South Florida Water Management uh, District website is the slew of information and 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 things they do there, um, from you know real time uh, data. You know the community and in the community and residents uh, section where you can go into the education center and find you know many lessons which made our job a lot easier, especially as teachers where we're always looking for good resources. So going into that their website and into the uh, education center, um, we found many lessons, and the one that caught our attention, well, you know, caught most of our attention was the macro invertebrates and how they um they can they can distinguish whether a water source you know like a resource is, is healthier or unhealthy depending on the actual macro invertebrates um part of the lesson focus was on water pollution and creating awareness of conservation or protection of of our waters um but it as as uh, ilana said that it ties into all the standards so we we kind of took a fourth grade, uh, third, fourth grade uh, lesson and, and converted it into a K-5 lesson where it can fit um, any, any of those uh, grade levels. For example, for the uh, kindergarten, you know, observing plants and animals, uh, you know, describing how they're alike and different. Um, first grade, you know, making observations of living things and so on. So basically, uh, the lesson entails uh, gathering uh, different uh, samples from water sources nearby, um, you know, and, and looking at what type of animals and, and different things come out of there. Um, we thought it was interesting where the, uh, you know, the amount of, of animals in a certain area can determine, you know, how healthy that water source is. Um, part of the lesson is going out into a water source, but we kind of adapted it where the teachers can probably uh, gather the sample from a water source and bring it in and the students can see these uh, different macro invertebrates um, using, you know, either hand lens or microscopes, uh, depending on, the, uh, on the, the, the resources that one has in their school available. Um, and really getting into the thick of it, you know, the, the kids love, you know, going outside and, and touching bugs and seeing bugs and, you know, we thought it was, it was, it was pretty fun and pretty, pretty cool to do. Um, as part of the, of the lesson, okay, and the, the resources, we took the lesson plan straight from the South Florida Water Management, where it tells you step by step what to do. They got some great posters. Um, depicting all the different little uh, macro invertebrates that that uh, that you can find, and um, you know we thought that, that that would be pretty cool. Um, as as bringing the scientists in, um, we thought it would be cool to have them there. You know, you know, explaining to the kids and um, and you know seeing what what they're finding and probably like you know basically. Um, you know, guiding 
the students, you know, whether virtually or, or in person, hopefully, um, you know, that would be even better. Um, I don't know, Maria, how you would want to talk about how you would probably incorporate it in your classroom. Um, we talked about as a group. Learning in progress. The different <laughs> <laughs> ways that we could do an extension to our lesson plan and do hands-on activities. And uh, one was doing a, a filter system and we have the specifics on different ways on how your class or your students can do these different filters using plastic bottles and different uh, things to filter through like sand and rocks or um, coffee filters, cotton balls, different things and you can sort it out and see which one filters the most or the best. Uh, there's also um, an activity on how to make a river very similar to the ones that was presented using the box and um, sand or dirt with uh, a river kind through and, and, and a spray. And so you could see how water moves along our peninsula that it's flat, but at the end there's a, um, <laughs> a slant. So to simulate the the Everglades, the slow movement of river of grass. Um, and kids will see how the water will eventually go south and end in our ocean. So everything's connected. Uh, there's also another activity of how to create limestone. Mm. So they can see what limestone is made out of. Um, so you use like plaster and seashells and other things to make it really porous. And then you can break it into pieces and, and use it as part of that filter mm -hmm. uh, strata. So there's many different ways that you can demonstrate um, what we're trying to teach here as a whole unit. Mm -hmm. as an extension, you know, we thought even, you know, going into social media and, you know, discussing ways how to prevent pollution and, and, and so on, you know, um, I think the, the, uh, the, the possibilities are endless to help, you know, the, the youth learn about pollution and the importance of protecting these waterways. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's part um, environmental and part educational, which makes it a uh, perfect marriage for uh, you know a, a great future. So, Ilana. Yep. Um, oh, I just I to add on there. Um, so, going back to the water filtrations, I had found through our stem scopes. I'm in Palm Beach County. Through our STEM scopes, there was an engineering challenge called, titled Muddy Waters, which basically, you know, they've got to design, construct, and test a filter system. Um, and, you know, that can be incorporated with our scientists too, like even taking a field trip. My school's located less than a mile from the intercoastal and also less than a mile from um, a spill, the spillway, a canal. So just getting them out in their environment really and seeing, okay, you know, what is, what's in the water nearby. <laughs> so again, we had so many resources, so, so much information that we could have, um, you know, you could go several different ways with making a lesson for this. And another thing that I want to include uh, that really got my attention and I really loved and enjoyed was the Kings of the Springs yeah. and what they're doing with our, our, our springs, which are so important and very few kids know about. Mm -hmm. So make that present as well. Okay. Um, so to kind of reach our students, um, I'm 
in my group, um, I'm kindergarten and I do everything virtually. Um, so what my piece that I contribute to the presentation was basically just putting that virtual spin on it. Um, and like they said, we, we pretty much for our unit, we try to cover all the standards from K to five so that any grade level will be able to own this. And here we just have some different examples of what the pieces of our lesson plan will kind of look like. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to tap that fast. So as you kind of go through um, in the nearer pod, pages five through 10, will kind of be that illicit or engaged stage um, where we got our lessons started. And this could have been in the form of you know, what we were really doing in classroom when we put that KWL chart or a sticky note chart up and we asked them a question. You know, you can modify the question to fit your grade level. Something that was boom, boom, and quick to the point with kindergarten, um, can you clean water? You know, just to kind of get their minds going, they would kind of respond yes or no, and you would kind of get a feel of where your students are if they think that something like this is possible because you'll demonstrate it at a later part of the lesson. Um, another way to kind of elicit and engage for a different grade level, you may want to post just the image and then ask them a higher order question to kind of get the lesson started. But again, um, as we show slides five through 11 will, will be modified ways how you can use it according to your grade level. For a higher grade level, maybe fourth or fifth grade, you may have more than one um, question here where they will respond out what they know about a word or something new as it relates to like the KWL piece. Um, I'm going to quickly move to try to get through um, to slide 11. Here is a, um, this is called a collaborative board um, in Neuropod, and it's a good way, um, even if you are in classrooms working more to or virtual, um, you can kind of, instead of wasting your money on sticky notes, if you have access to technology, pose the questions and the students can um, look for illustrations straight through Google to find, to kind of find an answer to respond here, or they can simply just use the sticky note and type out their answers so that um, you can kind of capture where your students are at the beginning of the lesson. All right. And then teachers can have like that bird eye view of students respond. Again, all of these are example of illicit or engage um, pieces to kind of get your lesson started. Oh, let me go back real quick. Um, for those of you who may be familiar with Flipgrid, you can also utilize Neuropod in Flipgrid. Um, this activity we're gonna post. So if you want to one, just copy what's already plugged in here and kind of own it for your grade level, the groundwork is already done for you. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel as it applies to this lesson um, that we modify here. So you can pose a flip grid response question here and your students could, um, could respond out whether through video or audio um, in terms of what they know about water pollution or whatever question you want to pose to them. Another example here is the collaborative board, um, similar to one that I showed in the beginning. Then when we think about that explore piece, um, Nearpod has a building piece here in our lesson plan, you'll see that the explore piece is the video. Um, and basically you'll give the instructions, you'll tell them, you know, while watching the video, we want you to jot down what you hear about the vocab words. The video is already plugged in here to the Nearpod. You don't need to go look for or search or find for it. Play it down your screen, or if your kids are virtual, um, they'll be able to play it on their own. I'm just going to fast forward through because you guys have access to it through the um, code that we gave you. But the video is there. Then you will move on to that extend piece of the lesson. This will be the plug where we were saying we will have our scientists be able to join us for our lesson um, to kind of bring it alive for the students so that they can see it in a different way. Um, in addition to that, um, depending on how you plan the lesson with the scientist who's visiting, this may be a good point for you to actually go ahead now and do that project. Um, we, provide, we provided um, a link um, for you to actually see an example of one of the projects um, here. You guys can click on that and follow the steps. The materials are pretty easy for students to, um, or even teachers to kind of save at home, recycle and bring in the day of the project. Very cost friendly, affordable. 
And then here um, we have some of our extension pieces where there are additional videos and additional resources that are there on our Word document of our lesson plan. The videos are already embedded here so you don't have to go out and kind of reinvent the wheel. Then when we talk about that closing out assessment piece or the evaluation piece, you can go ahead and match up some of the vocabulary words. Um, you guys will see it different on your screen. You'll actually see the words that you match up. Or I can quickly show you like some of the vocab words where you would you know ask the students to match up and you'll get real life data right there for yourself. Or you can do it in the form um, of a quiz. I think the quiz, Maybe the quiz is after this. Give me a second, guys. I think I may have needed to move that slide over. And then um, you can do your quiz. You can do the quiz in the form of um, open-ended responses or have um, multiple choices. I just put an example here of one multiple choice question. And then what we would suggest that you kind of close out with, since you don't have the scientists there with you, you can actually take them on a virtual reality field trip right there, right here in Nearapod um, to kind of let them view and examine the water. I remember Jose was talking about having those um, different waters there so they can kind of see it in the jug. This is also another example of kind of just providing them with another visual to be able to see it. Um, and again, we tried our best to kind of just modify it for each grade level. You guys have access to this code. I'll also put a link for it in the Google Drive. Um, and all you'll do is just copy and then save it to your Nearapod library and adjust it how you would need it to. But the groundwork has pretty much been set for you. Um, and Alana is going to go ahead um, and close us out. Can I say something real quick, Alana? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, uh, no, no. Go ahead, Jose. Uh, I'm glad I saw, I saw uh, Ms. Mitchell. I saw your, your comment. Yes, we did get it from the St. John's uh, Water Management District, the, the resources. In the South Florida one, it, it directs you to more resources, and we did find it on there. I don't know the competition that you guys have against with each other. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a competition? Uh, but, uh, but yeah, uh, we were very excited when we saw that resource. <laughs> and Because um, I know there is water uh, quality contests um, throughout the, the county also. There's a video, there's a neat video of different districts bringing in their water samples to have a water quality taste test. So, mm -hmm. but no, thank you for the resources in, in, in all of these and working together. You know, I think we're, we can, we can come up with a, with a solution. Um, go ahead, Ms. Uh, yeah. Nixon. You, you said it well, we, we appreciate all the help with, you know, the um, Brian and you know your team and the scientists that we were matched with, um, Dr. Cruz and and Jill. We had a great time. Learned a lot. <laughs> Again, we want to thank everybody uh, who participated, especially you know our our scientists for their insight. Thank you. And thank you very much, guys. And that's our presentation. Awesome. We are on to our final presentation, which is the South Cross Bayou. And I think they said they have individual videos. So I will um, mute myself and allow the first presenter. OK, well, yeah, so we do have in individual um, videos. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to share my lesson plan. Brian said we could run over that we're not really set. So if you guys want to share videos, whatever works for your group, don't feel pressed for time. Okay. And you guys see my plan? Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, just to kind of, I know we're a little pressed for time, even though he said we can go over, but I don't want to keep anyone longer. Um, so our group, was the South Cross Bayou. And um, we basically learned all about wastewater and how it needs to be treated um, before it can be repurposed. So um, I chose to do a STEM lesson, just kind of combining almost a lot of the different resources that we got. So here I put the first thing that is that we, the teacher would engage the students by creating the wastewater themselves. So our scientists did it for, you know, we actually did this activity and I thought it was a great visual where we just get a bucket of water and start just putting in things that we normally put on our drains like shampoo and 
food particles and toilet paper and just kind of mix it all up. Um, then the second thing would be to bring in a scientist to just kind of talk about the process of wastewater and how it gets cleaned. And then I would have the, um, the students actually try to clean our bucket that we made of wastewater by um, making their own filtration device. So this would be a STEM project. So they would, you know, in groups have to engineer it. I would give them um, materials, different filters that they could use and uh, have them test their little prototypes to see if it actually does clean the water. Um, you can actually purchase little pH um, uh, test kits, like $4 if you wanted to actually test it, but if not just to kind of compare the beginning, you know, dirty water and it should come out cleaner um, at the end. And then for the technology part, the, the students can share their findings through a PowerPoint that they create. And that's about it. And then assessment, um, besides our regular topic assessment, this is on the fifth grade standard of separating mixtures and solutions. So that they realize that there's different ways to separate um, solutions, like through the activity with the wastewater. Um, there's different processes. So also they would need different filters for bigger items or smaller items, things like that, magnetic items. And that's about it. That's my part. So I think Mercedes was next. Yes, um, and I, sorry. Yeah, I'm gonna just play my video. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> just a PSA, I recorded it with the intention of controlling interruptions, but my baby still woke up through the middle of it and it's a little distracting. So I'm sorry, but here we go. Can you all see it and hear it? Okay. No, not yet. We hear you and okay. we just see a black screen. A black screen? With your name on it. Yes, the black screen with your name on it. Okay, I'm pulling it up right now. Okay, now it's coming. All right. I'm focused. Hi, so this is my fourth grade lesson and I have decided to um, focus on the impacts of on our Florida wastewater. Um, I am going to use the platform Nearpod. Um, I was an e-learner teacher last year and really enjoyed Nearpod and so did my students and I feel like this is a great way to deliver the lesson and incorporate all the resources that um, are needed to deliver the objectives. So um, I began my lesson with the goals and um, I want my students to know three main objectives by the end. Um, I want them to know what should and shouldn't go into the sewers. Um, I want them to be able to understand that our wastewater is treated and I want them to know that eventually that wastewater that treated wastewater um, is cycled back into our water systems um, and I also introduce vocabulary uh, and I include uh, each word with the definition with the definition and a picture um, so that the students understand those words better once they actually read about them. Um, of course, the big question is how do humans impact the water we use? And that is a fourth grade standards, life science standard. Um, I start by engaging the students with um, a video and I actually pulled this one from the Kings of Springs and they created this video on 
short video on the wonders of Florida. So I want them to kind of get a look at, you know, how beautiful our water is and eventually make the connection of how we, we can harm that water. After engaging them, um, I also will include a poll just to get a glimpse at what they do and don't know. Do you know what wastewater, wastewater is? And they will answer yes or no. Um, after engaging them, we'll go ahead and just start exploring what, um, what we do in our homes. So we'll start with the conversation about in the restroom, what are some activities that might happen um, and from that conversation, just start to evolve it into what is actually going down the drain, down the toilet, when we shower, when we eat, really get them thinking about what is happening in their homes. Um, and that will lead to the conversation of where that water's going and sewage systems. Um, and giving them a, an explanation, a brief explanation of what a sewer is. And I really like this diagram that Cross by South Cross Bayou um, gave us this week. And it just, you know, has the house and it demonstrates how it goes into the sewage system. And then there's, it clearly defines that there's also a storm drain, which isn't the same. But after a conversation about what we do at home, I want to get more into specifics of what are the actual items that go into the sewage system, liquids, you know. And the students are able to actually post once they are doing this with me. They post their answers in here and they all get to share, um, which is what I really like about Nearpod. They all have a voice. So in the classroom setting, you usually call out on students, but I like this because I can still call on students, but I know that everyone has shared something. Uh, and then we'll dive into like, well, are those items that we're flushing into the system beneficial or not? And this is a great visual of how flushable wipes can damage the sewage systems. Um, after that conversation, we will have another poll about whether or not it matters what we flush. And at this time, I'll gauge like if they are getting the concept that it does matter. I'm checking in constantly with them. And then we are going to watch this video. Um, and it dives into, it's a kid-friendly video, and it dives into how um, the waste the treatment facilities, wastewater treatment facilities, play a role into the water, the wastewater. Um, we will also be reading in the classroom um, the section wastewater is treated from this booklet that was provided by our group this week and it dives in more to what happens at the wastewater facility. So after we've explained sewers and wastewater treatment facilities, um, I'm going to give them, oh, this is a, so this will be like a game version, time to climb. Um, and it's a game version of what questions that they might need to know like how do humans impact the water we use the questions that's the big question the, i wanted you to see the questions in the game but it's going to basically it's like a little exit ticket but it looks like a game to them and it asks like should you flush toilet paper and it allow it's like a little challenge it has more questions but it wouldn't it won't let you see them um but the kids love love playing like that game and we'll revisit the big question, how do humans impact the water we use? And after we're done with this um, entire 
lesson over a span of like two days, three days, we will, um, I will give them three options to demonstrate what they've learned. So I'm going to pause it and just walk you through it because I, I'm talking so slow in this video. Um, so the three final options are the first one will be that they can um, write a letter um, to the newspaper and just basically ask citizens to consider what they're putting down the, the toilet when they go to the restroom and how that impacts the wastewater. The second project is um, they can create a poster on what the do's and don'ts of what they can flush down the toilet um, and put down their drains at home. And then the third option that they can choose from is to create a video on wastewater, on what wastewater is and the impacts humans have on that. So it just took a very long time to get through it on the video. So I just stopped it. But um, and then after we're done with this whole lesson on um, wastewater, I want my scientists to come in for a QA and a um, based on the hydrosphere and water impacts, human impacts on water. And that's it. Sorry. Okay, I'm trying to figure okay. Do we uh, have our next speaker from that group? That's me. Um, okay, so I'm next. I have a video to show you. Um, I want you to keep in mind that this is just a snippet of the lesson. I plan to incorporate um, I teach kindergarten, so I plan to incorporate reading, math, and science standards as well. Um, science as far as the five senses and such, math is in counting, and then just some general um, reading standards. But I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and pull up that video for you. Okay, can you see my video? Yes, okay, I'm going to start it. Your sound is very low and it may be the issue that we had last week with videos. It's a, if it's not within the video itself, it's within the, um, the settings where okay. there's the toolbar that says share screen and there's an audio setting in there. And it, if you un, there's like one button you have to unclick. It's a checked like square. And in that square, it says something like match the volume of your video to your voice or something like that. And you don't want to do that because it lowers the volume of your video. Trying to find that. So it'll be on the bar, this share bar towards the top of your screen. Okay, so. There should be an audio setting. Yeah, I see same as system. It might be that one. Try kick, unclicking okay. or clicking that and see what happens. Let's see. Does that help? No, it's still really low. Is it low? It's low for everyone, right? Yeah, maybe try stop sharing and then sharing again now that you have a different. Okay. And I think it asks you right when you share to use computer audio. Okay, try this again. No, I'm not sure how to fix it. You're sharing the video that she shared, her YouTube that talks about the facility. That's what we hear. Hold on. know the impact they have on wastewater Better? and know what happens to the wastewater. The standard we are focusing on is for social studies. It is located and described in high school.
it's still really low. Yeah, I think it's that that box still. So if you did you click on that audio in there and it has something about like it's like microphone volume and speaker volume or something like that is I'm trying to remember the exact wording, but it's definitely a checked box. You have to either put a check in or uncheck it because you don't want what it's doing is basically competing with where your voice was and lowering itself so that you could speak over it and you don't want it to do that. I think you want to find somewhere where it says like to use your computer sounds. Yeah. So it says um, speaker is same as system, microphone is same as system. One of those needs to be the opposite of however you had it set up before. Uh, so either. I think you have to uncheck those if they are checked now. Um, I also have this one that's checked that says automatically adjust microphone volume. That, I think that might be it. Try that one. Okay. I don't know. I don't know how to fix it, so. Maybe no worries. Do you, no worries. You just, yeah. Do you just want to talk us through it a little bit, even if it's not the four minutes, just tell us a little bit about what you do informally. Okay. Um, so this one is a jar. We're going to make wastewater, you know, cause it's kindergarten. It's the beginning of the year. So they don't know where the bathrooms are on campus. They don't know where it is in the classroom. So we're going to introduce the restrooms. Um, and then introduce what wastewater is to the students, ask them what they um, think that they, you know, if they know what it is and stuff like that. And then we're going to simulate that using products from home. Um, you know, use like cocoa powder to simulate poop, use um, colored water to simulate pee, um, other stuff that goes down the drain like soap, shampoo, um, body wash, stuff like that. Um, and then we're also going to introduce um, toilet paper to the jar, baby wipes and flushable wipes and things like that, that they may put down the drain, also like paper towels. And then we're gonna stir it up together and we're gonna see how the toilet paper breaks up, but how some of the other things don't break up. Um, and then I'm gonna fast forward this video a little bit. That's what I'm explaining here. And then after that, I have a sewer box. This is going to represent the sewer. Um, and then inside there's um, cut pieces of paper, construction paper um, that are accordion folded. Um, the blue stands for water, the yellow stands for pee. And then inside of the sewer box, each kid is gonna get called up. They have to stick their hand in the sewer and they're gonna, <laughs> they're gonna pick out an image. I have um, laminated images in there. I chose to use real images because it is kindergarten and sometimes they may get confused with the clip art, but these are actual items they can find in their home. Um, for instance, um, right here, I ended up picking out a little picture of flushable wipes. Um, and then we're going to discuss um, with that child who picked it out in the class, whether we think these are things that um, can be flushed or things that cannot be flushed. Um, and then on the board behind me, um, you'll see it says what's in the sewer. On this side, it says you can flush. And then on this side, it says do not flush. I'm gonna have Velcro on the back of each image and they can decide if it's something that needs to be flushed or something that can't be flushed. And then the child after our discussion is gonna decide which side it goes on and then they're gonna walk up to the board and stick it on the board. Um, I've also included other images like that diagram um, that shows the difference between sewer and storm drain. Um, the same image that has um, a pump that has the flushable wipes all over it. And that's how the uh, kindergartners can see this is why we don't flush those items. Um, I also have pictures of a bathroom, a washer and a dryer and a kitchen. So we can talk about where those different drains are in our household and in our classroom. Um, that the water can go down and those items can go down um, and talk about, you know, how we need to be careful what 
you know, what's going down, what drain, um, this, that, and the other, so we can make sure that we're not messing up our sewer system. I also have images of the trucks and cameras and items and the pumps that push all the water from our houses um, over to the wastewater facility um, to talk about how our water um, is going from our homes and our school and into those facilities and um, where what we flush can cause an issue between our home and those items in our community. And um, I plan on having the scientists come in to talk about um, their job description um, and what they do and how what we do um, can affect our water system so that they have an understanding of what they're doing um, affects it. Um, and I think that's about it. Was there another member of this group? Yes, me. Last one. <laughs> okay, um, let me share my desktop. Give me one second and it won't let me. Um, did you give me access already? You should have access, yes. Okay. Do you see the share screen at the bottom? Uh, um, hold on. It's welcome to the life of Mac and Mac is telling me, hold on to go to system preference. Yeah, you have to give it probably permission to share. Yes, your screen. I do. Yeah. Uh, sorry, didn't know this was gonna happen. Okay, let me try now. Sorry, we use, um, we don't use Zoom in our district. So, and when we use Zoom hasn't been to share any of my screen. So sorry about that. It's no problem. Do, are you working on a Google slideshow? If so, maybe you could share the link with me. I'd be happy to. No. Oh, okay. Um, I did not. I'm so sorry. It's okay. You could also send the file via Zoom chat if that's if that's. So an I'm going to see now if they'll let me. Ah, there we go. Okay. Perfect. You can see my screen. Perfect. Okay. So, um, let me click this and lock this out and go away. Thank you very much. Go away. It will get stuck in there. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and share uh, the activities within my lesson plan instead of sharing the videos, be, in part because it's already 1219. Okay, so um, the first thing I would do is I would do the same log as what we did uh, participating in this workshop. I would have the students log like what what they did in the shower at home, what they did um, in the sink in the morning, everything where they use water within their homes, not outside, okay? And then I would have them log in also what they do in school because I'd see we use a sink in the classroom. You know, we use a sink in the bathroom. I would have them log in. I would have them do this prior. And the reason why I would have them do it prior is because I want to use some of that information afterwards to create the board. Okay, we are, I'm also doing a board where the students will also sort the items that can and, and cannot be used and go through, go through the drain. But um, I want to use it based on the information that they provide so I can make, have them make the connection with what they use and not necessarily what I use. Okay, so we would do it prior to the lesson and I would have them log for three days. I would read the way well, wastewater is treated, which is from Project Wild, which is the pamphlet that earlier was shown to you guys. Um, I would do the experiment. I like to do a lot of things hands-on for the students and not just everything with visuals. Um, our students spend so much time already on the computer nonstop. And don't get me wrong, I'm technology. 
I teach students how to code within my classroom, within my science. So it's not that I have anything against it, but I know they want our kids to go back to interacting with each other and not just a computer screen. So one thing I would do is um, have them understand there's a lot of students that brought uh, flushable wipes to school in the past, and that's why I brought it up when we were talking about waste management, because I've seen them in the classroom, and I wanted to know whether they can be flushed or not. So one thing I would have them do is have them have two cups of water, one they would put toilet paper that we use in our bathroom, and the other one they would put the flushable wipes. Shake it around, leave it there, go to lunch, come back. Okay, let's see what happens, okay? talk about what do you think is going to happen when it goes down your drain. Um, I would discuss the goals of the wastewater treatment facilities. What is their purpose? What do they do and how do they help us? I would then um, show them the video from the South Cross Bayou, which shows a tour of the entire facility, how everything goes. Now, I know some of the terminology they use will be a little bit higher, and I'll stop and explain it if I need to. But the main concept of what I want them to understand is perfectly explained within that video. Okay, um, then we would do questions and answers about things that can be flushed and not be flushed. We would share that information. At this point, meet with the scientists and have them, by now I've built a little bit of background on the students and I've given them information and things that they are, can ask questions about. I don't wanna start with the scientists first because it'll be like, oh, I don't have a question for them, but once they've done hands-on, once they've done activities, once they've read, they, ha they, they can have a repertoire of questions that they can ask and there could be that interaction. Um, they would sort pictures. Um, yes, I will use the video from You Can't Flush This. And um, uh, I would like to also have a virtual meeting with where our local wastewater goes. So it's not just the South uh, by you, but also where does our water go? Have someone from that staff meet with us and talk with us virtually. Um, I would then have them, I like to do a lot of engineering activities also in my class, so I would have them do the engineering process. I would have a series of materials. They, I would tell them that they are up to using whatever they would want. Um, but there's a certain amount, like you can only use an ounce of this or two ounces of that. Any materials that's there on the table, they would create theirs. Um, I, along the way, I would like to speak to them and ask them, okay, what changes have you made? Why did you make those changes? What worked, what didn't work? Get information from them. Afterwards, I would want them to create posters to put around the school so that the students in all grade levels not only can learn about what wastewater is and how it does, it's not, does not go to the ocean, but also start to encourage those students at other grade levels not to put things down the toilet that shouldn't be down the toilet. And in turn, hopefully they teach their parents as well. And then as far as a culminating activity, um, I use Scratch, I use Minecraft, and I know somebody's gonna say Minecraft, they play a game. Well, not in my class because one of the things that with Minecraft, when we do fire safety, the students have to recreate a room in their house and they have to put how, what, how they would go out, they would put posts there. So um, they could do the same. They could do in Minecraft, they can go in there and do an activity where they're showing me everything that they learned. They can draw, you know, they can make a plan, they can put posts, um, they can use Scratch and do something with coding, which what it turns out to be once the kids code it, it becomes like a little movie. Uh, or they can use PowerPoint or Sway. When my students start with me the first two to three weeks of school, I'm teaching them how to use all these tools so that afterwards they can use them. I like to give them the freedom of present it any which way you want. And the good thing about it is I don't get photocopies. I hate photocopies, which I tell them, I go, please don't copy what your neighbor, if I wanted your neighbor, I go on a photocopy machine, make 10 copies, voila, I got it. So, and as far as assessment, I do tell them that scientists have a journal. I have samples of science, scientist journals that I put in my classroom. So I want journals. I make them number when they start school, they learn how to date it. They learn how to write what it is, the subject. What are we talking about? It's on the board. So all you have to do is copy what I wrote on the board, what we're doing today. So that way it makes sense what you wrote. So my assessments is their science uh, journals. Um, I pick them up per week. You never know what week your table is being picked. 
So, um, uh, you know, they after like a week or two, they realize, hey, yeah, I have to really keep up with this because she does read them. Um, exit tickets, which are fantastic. Um, quizzes, we use Canvas. So a lot of things I put through Canvas for the students. I do a lot of the pre-reading is their homework because in class, I teach two, two groups of students because we, I do math and science for my class and another class. So there isn't that time for them to do all the reading. So the reading is either something that my team teacher will put in the, right, the reading for the week, if it's something in ex extensive or something that I assign them. So, um, but we use a Canvas and through there, it's, um, they'll see what is expected. The standards are there, everything's there so that if they go home, they can also pull it up. It's not just what was written on the board. So um, the bottom line is the students at the end, after every exposure and everything they've done, they will um, present their work in whichever format they feel comfortable with. So we have a whole different, um, different work sample. And then as far as the combinations, um, I do get ESOL students. I do get ESE students. Um, I put a lot of visuals around in the classroom. That's why I do like the hands-on. I do group them. You will never be in the same group. So just because you sit in that table, that does not mean that you're gonna work with those students because you need to learn how to get along with different people and different personalities. So I move them around. I also move the jobs around. So if you were recording for this experiment, for the next experiment, you might be the person pouring the things or collecting the materials so that you get different roles. And that way, those students that are shy, you know, start to come out of their shell. So um, pretty much that's it. Awesome, everybody, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing these excellent resources. I'm really, really excited about what you all put together. A special take, uh, thank you to Carrie for facilitating this session. She did an amazing job and we really appreciate it. But as we start to wrap up, one thing I'm going to ask you to do is, as Bruce mentioned, take that survey. I'm going to put that survey link in the chat right now. I know it is a bit past 12, but if you're willing to spend the extra time to do this with fidelity and put your true thoughts and feelings into the survey, it would really mean a lot to us. Um, once we are able to collect data in this fashion, it really helps us grow the program um, and advocate for the program in additional ways so we could do more types of sessions and professional development opportunities just like this. So I'm going to stay here in obviously in this session as you go through the survey if you have any questions about the way it's worded what something is in reference to feel free to unmute ask me a question um, and then um, at that point if you're completely done just type done in that chat box just to let me know you're done and then you're good to go at that point. Um, and just for additional clarity, this survey will be only for teachers, scientists, if you have any additional feedback, feel free to email Stephanie or myself as we'd love to hear it. But this one specifically will be for teachers. Um, 